Okay, talking about minimizing patient exposure. The objectives that I've identified, I just copied and pasted this straight off of the ARRT's website. This is the section that we're interested in. It's under the umbrella term of safety, and it's part two, radiation protection. Um, there are 31 total questions about this section, right? Just to give you an idea of its weighting on the exam. Uh, out of 200 questions, 31 questions coming from this material. Uh, looking at ways to minimize patient exposure and all of the technical considerations that are designed for that. So the first thing that we frequently see are questions about exposure factors. Um, so going back to questions of image production, we see those production questions now in the safety section. But it's asking the question of like, okay, knowing what we know about KVP and mass, what are ways to minimize patient dose? And so from the dose point of view, from patient safety point of view, using a high KVP and a low mass will reduce patient dose. Now for a lot of students, this seems backwards, right? But one way to think about it is if we put enough um, power behind these x-rays, they are more likely to just pass through the patient's body without any interaction occurring, to just zip straight through their body without any ionizing event occurring, right? So that's why we're saying that this high KVP and a low mass would reduce patient dose. Also using a higher KVP allows us to further reduce mass, and so we have things like the 15% rule that can guide that. The problem for us as x-ray technologists is that we're trying to make diagnostic images. So I could turn up the KVP and drop the mass and get you crappy looking pictures all day long, right? Because what happens as we turn up the KVP to things like image contrast? It decreases. In fact, it, it gets really, really crummy, right? Um, if you want an example of that, feel free to go over the radiation therapy suite and see the types of portal imaging that they get. They're using a mega, mega electron volt energy. The pictures are very difficult to see because they're primarily using Compton scatter to guide attenuation. So what we need is a balance between diagnostic efficacy and decreased patient dose. So the types of questions that you might get is which of the following techniques would reduce patient dose, right? And as a tendency, as a, again, the, the choice is going to be whatever has the highest KVP and the lowest mass, right? Now, are there other technical considerations that affect patient dose? Yes, in fact, using an extended SID would also decrease patient dose, right? Um, uh, doing anything to reduce exposure time reduces patient dose. So when we get to fluoroscopy, time will be a significant consideration. How do we reduce fluoro time, right? Um, proper use of an automatic exposure control device should reduce patient dose while still providing an appropriate amount of exposure to the image receptor, right? That's assuming we're using the AEC properly. Improper use of the AEC could result in an increased patient dose, right? And the final thing that I might mention on here, I know it's not on the sheet, but as we increase beam filtration, Oftentimes we are reducing patient skin dose, right? Because as we filter the beam more and more, we're reducing the garbage x-rays as it were, right? Things that would just ionize the patient's skin and stop there, but provide no diagnostic information. So here's a box that comes from uh, one of the textbooks looking at exposure factor considerations, things that would influence patient dose. Um, the mass per unit volume of tissue in the area of clinical interest. What this is saying is that a hand x-ray has less dose than an abdomen x-ray. Why? Because a hand has less volume of tissue in the area of interest. Makes sense, right? Things like effective atomic, atomic numbers and electron densities influence patient dose. What's an example of this from clinic? Well, anytime we inject the patient with IV contrast or use barium contrast, we are increasing patient dose. Why? Because we're increasing the amount of photoelectric interactions that are occurring, right, because of the presence of this high atomic number stuff, right? Um, 
using different types of image receptors. This was a significant consideration in the day of film, where if you used certain image receptors, you would be increasing patient dose. For us in the digital age, we, as we see a similar consideration when we think about using photostimulable phosphor plate technology, what we used to call CR cassettes, versus using digital imaging, like indirect or direct digital imaging. Because of the use of these different receptors, we would assume that the most, for the most part, the digital, the DR, the newer cassettes are gonna decrease patient dose. We can use techniques that can decrease patient dose. Why? Because they have a higher detective quantum efficiency, what we learned about, I think, a couple of weeks ago in digital imaging. Increasing the source to image receptor distance decreases patient dose. And this follows directly with the inverse square law, right? Um, so there has been stuff in the literature now about shooting certain exams at an even increased SID beyond the 72 inches that we generally use. So this is a question that we're continuing to ask. Um, how can we produce x-rays with a decreased patient dose? Well, we, we could figure out ways to further increase the SID. Is that practical for our exam rooms? Those types of things. Like I mentioned before, type and quality of filtration employed can largely decrease patient skin dose. Um, underneath filtration, the way that I generally talk about filtration has to do with filtration of the primary beam. So that total filtration, which is both inherent and added filtration, and we'll look at this more in just a sec. But there's other types of filtration, things like compensating filtration which we sometimes see people use for like feet examinations, which is like a wedge-shaped filter. So that, that's not the way I'm generally talking about filtration, compensating filtration, but compensating, compensating fil filtration can also decrease patient dose. Um, the type of generator used. So interestingly enough, with the portal machine, where it is largely direct current energy, it's powered by a battery, you can probably get a decreased patient dose out of a portal imager if you're using it appropriately, right? Because most of the stuff that we're seeing, especially in older x-ray rooms, um, the types of generators used fluctuated more in their power supply, which caused a fluctuation in photon energy. So an old school x-ray room is, is increasing patient dose versus the newest, most state-of-the-art generator, high-frequency generator, would provide us a decreased patient dose. Um, and then, like I've always, what kind of guides all of these considerations, so you shouldn't feel like your, your primary job is to sit around and decrease patient dose. So that, that, there, that is a big part of why you've gone to school and why you get paid the big bucks. Um, but the question for us, it's not just that one thing. It's not just how do we decrease patient dose, because we could turn down the juice on all these machines and get crappy pictures at a decreased dose all day long, like I've said before. Um, our primary question is, how do we get a good diagnostic image at a minimum dose, right? It's a balance. Good picture at a low dose. Because frankly, what's gonna kill a patient sooner is the um, stroke or the embolism or the traumatic fracture. That's gonna kill them a lot sooner than the x-rays ever will, right? Like I did the math this morning on how many CT scans would you need to get in a day to hit that threshold of acute radiation syndrome. It's about 10,000. You need to get close to 10,000 CT scans in a day to kill a fool, right? Um, so with, with that in mind, just know that um, most of what we're interested in is getting good pictures, right? Getting good pictures. If we can minimize patient dose, awesome. Right? The best way you can decrease patient dose is just to not have repeat images. So to know your procedures, to know your anatomy, to be able to line things up in your head and not have to repeat images. Because every time you repeat an image, you just double the patient's dose. Right? So when we're up in peds and the question is, um, do I try to cone more and possibly clip anatomy or leave it open? Leave it open. If there's ever a question, leave it open so you're not shooting that baby twice. Right? Um, we'll come back to this um, in a minute when we talk about personnel, right? Because maybe one thing in the back of your mind as I'm talking about this is that term Alara. Well, Benny, what about Alara? Uh, 
Well, interestingly enough, the ART says Alara only relates to personnel safety. We do not, what they're carefully saying, and I'll come back to this in a minute, is Alara doesn't relate to patients, right? The idea is to minimize patient dose while at the same time providing diagnostic efficacy. I don't want to get too far into the weeds of that. <clears throat> All right, shielding. The rationale for shielding of patients is being challenged. This is a controversial subject right now, but for the purposes of the registry, you need to know shield your patients, right? That's, that's, what, the, that's what the registry says. Shield your patients. Um, gonadal shielding should be employed anytime the reproductive organs are within five centimeters of a properly collimated beam. I don't know where that magical number five centimeters came from, but it's out there, it's in the literature. What the ART would give you would be a range of numbers. It would say anything from like four to seven centimeters of the primary beam, and five centimeters is in that range. So you'd be picking a range, like two to one centimeters, uh, four to seven centimeters, 10 to 15 centimeters, something like that. So you don't necessarily need to remember five, just know um, if it's as close as my hand, if my junk's as close as my hand to the primary beam of x-rays, I want to be shielded, right? Um, and that's pretty much the way that I explain it to most of my patients is we're just replacing the shield here for the protection of your reproductive organs, right? Something like that. The reality is, is that most the, any exposure to the patient's organs is going to come from internal scatter anyways, right? So the best thing that you can do is just to limit the collimated beam to the area of interest, right? Um, has anyone ever seen a tech shield a female patient during a KUB? Right. No. It simply doesn't happen, and why not? It obstructs the anatomy. Yeah, it, it obstructs the anatomy of interest, and so that's the tension that we're in, right? Um, basically, anytime we should shield, whenever it does not compromise the diagnostic value of the exam, and part of this is encouraging education among our patients, so we're letting them know radiation causes harm to reproductive organs. That's something everyone in the general public should know if they haven't already learned it from watching TV shows and stuff. Um, and then the other thing is to communicate to them that we care. Education and caring is the, is the main reason that I still shield. Um, it is not, it is a secondary measure. It does not replace proper collimation, right? One thing that I've added to this list is please clean the dang things, right? They are nasty, and using them, even the ones that are on wheels, please clean them at least every other exam or something, even if it did not come in contact with the patient, because there's all sorts of germs and ugly things that don't require any contact, right? Um, and then uh, gonadal shielding, if there's ever any question, does reduce radiation exposure, right? So there's research out there that suggests that gonadal shielding does reduce uh, radiation exposure. It's more effective in males than in females for obvious reasons due to the anatomy, um, but that one millimeter is ideal for energy ranges up to 120 KE, kVp. They want you to know different types of shielding and to think critically about when would we apply these different types of shielding, right? Um, so it's not enough just to know flat contact is one centimeter lead or one millimeter lead and that shadow shields are suspended from collimators and stuff like that, or that shaped contact shields are basically like a jockey strap made out of lead. That's not enough to know. You need to know where would I use this, right? So a great example of where would I use shaped contact. Well, if I'm working with a patient, male patient, um, and I'm gonna be x-raying them from multiple different directions, shaped contact would be the way to go. Like if I had a choice of using a shaped contact shield for like a, um, a barium uh, enema examination, shaped contact would be the way to go. Because what are we doing? We're giving them barium and then we're flipping them around and x-raying them from every po possible point of view, right? Um, so uh, where would I wanna use something like a, sh a shadow shield? Well, a place like the operating room where um, there's sterile fields and things like that, and I, I did not get a chance to get in there with the patient prior to them being draped and place a shield over them, that's gonna be an ideal place to use um, shadow shielding, right? Um, and I would, I would recommend, if you wind up working in the operating room, get to know your doctors, get to know the procedures that you're doing, and if there are situations where you can shield your patients, shield your patients in the OR. I used to do that quite a bit. Go in as they're, as they're bringing the patient in, and once they slip them onto the table, placing a shield underneath them, right? 
because with the sea arm for the most part the, the tubes underneath them right it's not going to hurt anything it shows that you've got that kind of added professional level like if a, if a anesthesiologist or a nurse charge nurse sees that they know this person knows their stuff and they're here to help my patient and that's what we're all here to do they're part of the team um anytime we place the shield uh we would want to place it directly over reproductive organs, right? That's the primary thing that we're interested in shielding. We've pretty much given up on any kind of shielding of the thyroid, um, breast tissue, things like that. We're just here to shield reproductive organs because of the harm that it causes future generations. So in terms of the patients, right, we are primarily concerned with just shielding of the reproductive organs, right? I'm thinking in the back of my mind about one patient I had once who absolutely demanded to have her thyroid shield during a, a PA and lateral chest examination, right? Um, it, was, it was ridiculous. Um, and uh, I, it was very, very stressful to try to explain to her all the nitty gritty of this, right? She knew, she felt like it was her right to be shielded at all levels, and for whatever reason, the thyroid was her thing. Um, so be aware that in your role as an educator to patients, Letting them know when you have those challenging patients, answering their questions as best as possible within that cultural context is, is going to be your friend. Um, there are all sorts of uh, topographic um, landmarks, bony landmarks that we would be interested for placement of shields, but I, don't, I can't think of a single time that I ever palpated for the symphysis pubis in order to know where to place a shield on a guy. Um, it, pretty much it's, you know, below the hips you're good, right? Um, for the for the female patient, I have not ever seen registry questions asking you where you would want to place these things, but that is appro approximately the level of the uh, the ovaries. You know, uh, what does it say? An inch medial to the palpable as is. Okay, now I've mentioned how significant SID is to, to reducing patient dose. Um, so we need to know what our SIDs are, right? Um, this is why I asked you in image production to you know, buy a measuring device so that you can measure things like an SID while you're working portably, because it influences things like image exposure. It also affects patient dose. Um, it affects us uh, as we're working with the machine as well. Um, so we want to make sure that the lights in any way that we line up these machines is accurate. Um, and I call this, um, the, uh, the milk rules. So we need to know that distance and centering indicators must be accurate to within 2% and 1% of the SID respectively, right? Um, so again, if you just remember it's the same percentage as milk, you should be okay, right? Because again, they're just interested in a range of numbers, um, and this is really nerding out at this point. Um, so you have to dig deep into some government documents to find where this regulation is at, right? FDA regulation. Um, but 2% of coincidence with the actual beam of x-rays. So what is this saying? If I'm at set a 72 inch SID, and the way that they measure this, they actually, let's talk about this way. If I set the machine at a 100 inch SID, because this is the way they measure this, that light that measures the SID or that length, that measuring tape, whatever it is, should be close to a hundred inches, right? It should read something accurate to like it, within 92 inches is what it should be. 92 to 102 inches, within two inches, it should be correct. That would be 2% of 100 inch SID, right? Um, for the centering, right? You can think about how vital centering is to everything that we do, right? How many times you've been asked, where did you center for this exam? or you've been really trying to make sure you're centered appropriately for it. It's really like the targeting um, of, the, of the sniper rifle, a, a, as you go, as you will. Um, this centering needs to be within a, a, a 1%. We need to, this machine should be very precisely centered, right? And that makes sense as well, right? That I'd want to be able to center appropriately, yes? Is that similar to the, the, the beam being within 1% perpendicular? Yes. Yes, that's it exactly. Yeah, so the question is, is this similar to the 1% of the beam being within perpendicular? It's the exact same thing, right? And it's one of the ways that they would measure it. Great question.
All right, beam limitation devices, things like the collimator, which the main collimator that we use is the variable aperture, rectangular collimator. Um, I don't know if any clinical sites that you're working with use like cones or anything like that, but this would be the same thing. Um, these devices reduce off-focus off radiation. So within the x-ray tubes, some x-rays are being made off-focus. They're not on the focal tract of the anode, right? We don't want those. We don't like those x-rays. Um, so the collimator is designed to reduce that, right? Um, <clears throat> so the term that might be used, I think the registry primarily uses off-focus radiation to indicate that, but there's other stuff in the literature like it's called stem radiation. I would just call it off-focus. Um, the main thing that we're using the collimator for, though, for us as x-ray techs is to confine the x-ray beam to just an, the area of interest, the anatomy of interest, right? Um, it needs to have an appropriate amount of luminance. That means that you should be able to see it, right? If the collimator light bulb goes out, guess what? The collimator is now out of compliance, right? That light bulb needs to allow you to see what it is that you're doing with this device. Um, can you still use a collimator even if you can't see it? Yes, you can. There should be measuring uh, measurements on the collimator somewhere that tell you what the cone size of the field is, right? Um, <clears throat> It should have an appropriate coincidence to the radiographic beam. There again, that coincidence is that 2% rule, right? It's saying the exact same thing as the SID thing. The collimated light field should correspond to the area of the actual x-ray beam by 2%, right? 2% or less. Um, PBLs are required for all x-ray techs that machines that have been made as since 1980 something. Um, positive beam limitation means that the collimator automatically limits the, uh, the cone light field to the anatomy. So if you set up for a hand x-ray, the light field should match the size roughly of a hand x-ray, versus if you set up for a KUB, it will match the size of a KUB. Right? You should be seeing that um, in the clinical fields. Any override of that to cone out requires you turning a key or disengaging some kind of interlock. Right. So you're overriding the positive beam limitation device. These are the types of critical thought that they expect you to understand about positive beam limitation. So for an example, for me as a student, I remember one time working with some equipment and I couldn't get the light field to open up anymore. Why can't I get it to open up anymore? And I realized I was at the wrong SID, right? So the PBL was working against me. This is really frustrating. I can't get it to open up. And I realized, oh my gosh, I set the SID wrong, so I set it at the right SID, and all of a sudden it's correct. Right? In fact, I need to cone in some. Um, in alignment, we've already mentioned. Filtration I've alluded to once, but I like this illustration here because it's got the two different types of x-rays illustrated. So we have a low-energy x-ray that has a long wavelength, right? Um, it is a low frequency photon. It is being stopped by the filter. This is the trash x-ray, right? Um, versus the high energy, high frequency, short wavelength x-rays, they are passing straight through the filter. They couldn't care less about the filter, right? Um, so w one way to think about this, this is my really trashy punk rock way of thinking about this is, there's the guys that can crush the beer can against their head, and there's the guys that can't, right? Um, the guys that can crush the beer can against their head, they don't care. You could crush beer cans against their head all day long, and they keep on going, right? The guys who can't try to crush one beer can against their head, and they're out, right? That's the way filtration's working, is it's knocking out the weaker photons, right? They, this has um, an effect on the absorbed dose to the patient, right? Um, particularly at the area of the skin on the side of the x-ray tube, right? Because those weaker inner x -ray, energy x-rays, they would just strike the patient on the side of entrance and be attenuated by the skin. That's what would happen to those weak x-rays. They add no diagnostic value to the image receptor. There's two types of filtration in this world, inherent and added, and you add them together to equal total filtration. So inherent filtration is things like the construction of the x-ray tube and the beryllium window on the x-ray tube. They filter out some x-rays. That's inherent. It was part of how the tube was built. 
versus added filtration. It's not something that you sit around and, and add yourself. You've never added filtration. This, the added is really just there for the health physicist. They can add filtration to the x-ray beam. It slides in between the tube and the collimator. They can, there's a little slot where they can slide in added filtration. That total filtration for the x-ray tubes that we play with, those that are capable of operating at energies above 70 kVp, it has to be 2.5 millimeters of aluminum equivalent, which is a number that's probably burned into your gray matter by this point, right? Now I mentioned that there is an other type of filtration, right? It has to have this word compensating out in front of it though. So here's an example of a compensating filter being used to do two things. It's reducing patient dose and improving image quality, right? This is the purpose of compensating filtration. So this is a wedge-shaped filter. The thicker part of the wedge would be towards the thinner part of the patient's anatomy, and it would allow for a reduction in exposure to the patient's toes while maintaining adequate exposure at the area of the, the navicular and the cuneiform bones, right? Because that side of the filter is thinner. All right, um, our patients oftentimes are, it's like they're out to get us or something in terms of their own radiation safety, right? And you can probably think of patients like the woman that I was talking about earlier, who have done things that weren't in their, in their best interest in terms of reducing radiation dose, right? Um, like patients who you ask them to take a second deep breath in and they say what and they turn around, right? And you've just hit the expose button, right? Example of those types of patient care considerations. So the first thing that I was ask you to do as a professional is to know all of your positioning backwards and front for whatever type of procedure you're about to engage in, right? Um, know your positioning, know where you're centering, know what are the shortfalls of the technology or the room that your equipment that you're working with, right? Any kind of uh, additional exposure increases patient dose. Um, so, and as much as this results from careless or poor judgment of the radiographer, we gotta get rid of that. It should just be the careless and poor judgment on the part of the patient, right? Because they're suffering and impaired, um, so we would expect them to not be always exercising their best judgment, right? So anything you can do to get the patient in your team or to get yourself on the patient's team, do it, right? Um, if that means referring to someone as grandma because they're calling you um, Uncle Billy, be Uncle Billy, right? Whatever you got to do. So effective communication comes with a whole lot of cultural baggage, right? Uh, meeting people where they're at culturally, understanding uh, their, frankly, their level of intelligence or whether or not they understand what you're telling them, right, is important. Quote unquote, dumbing down what you're saying may be necessary, right? Um, being aware of their culture and their context. People who cannot speak English will tell you they can speak English. If you ask someone, do you speak English? They will say yes, because they did not understand what you just said, right? You need to understand as an x-ray tech that you are required by law to provide a professional translator, right? I do not see that happen very often in clinic, and in fact, some clinical sites just pretend like that law doesn't exist, right? Um, but these are just ways to further make sure that you are communicating appropriately with the patient in order to minimize uh, the patient's radiation exposure. Um, one thing that I frequently do when I was working especially in CT is whenever possible give the patient a choice, right? Um, do you want to lay down on the table now or would you like to lay down on the table in two minutes, right? Is an example of a choice. Eventually at some point you will be laying down on the CT examination table. You can choose to do so now or later. So giving them choices um, whenever possible is a good thing. Unfortunately, that is not the case with pediatric patients. Kids do not like choices and they do not like novelty, right? They don't like you because you are new and you're presenting them with all sorts of awful choices, right? Um, if it was their choice, they wouldn't be here in this awful place to begin with, right? And so we see some pretty wild and outrageous behaviors on the, top, on the part of kids. And there's a lot of technologists who say things like, I hate working with kids. We need to understand that 
children are not just tiny adults, right? I sometimes hear people say that, that is simply not the case. They have different behaviors and different expectations. Children are best considered something to be something along the lines of like narcissistic space aliens, right? They're very, very self-centered. Um, their perspective on life is that they're surrounded by a world of giants who hate them and want to crush them, right? Um, that's largely the way that kids work, look at the world. Um, so for children, we frequently need some form of patient immobilization, right? Um, now, I say that, but I've seen those memes too out there about the pigistat and how awful it is, right? So I want to talk a little bit about behavior and psychology and how um, the pigistat may actually be your best friend, right? This is a book by Temple Grandin. I think there's recently a movie out about her as well. She's a very interesting woman who's got a doctorate in animal husbandry. She did her doctoral work on a humane way of killing cows, right? The woman also has autism. She's very, very intelligent, but she's also autistic. And one of the reasons she was able to get through her PhD work was she built a machine that could hug her, right? What it does is it provides a tremendous amount of pressure around her entire body, right? And this helps her to relax. Now, this is frequently the case, and we're finding more and more uh, psychological research about this. So we see now in the literature things like weighted blankets. And my wife and I use weighted blankets on some of the children who are under our care because the weighted blankets, the weight of that blanket helps the child relax, mm -hmm. right? I think this is very much also the case with the use of the pigistat. So I don't know that I would explain all of that to the parents, right? The way that I would frame the pigistat for parents, right, is that we need to make sure the child is immobilized during the exam so in order to minimize the radiation dose, right? This immobilization does not hurt your child, right? In fact, with some children, it may help them relax, right? Similar to wrapping them up tightly in a blanket. Now, the mom may at that point say, my child does not like being wrapped up in a blanket, right? We'll let them know that the child probably will cry when we place them inside the immobilizing device, right? That cry is actually helpful to us because it allows us to make sure that we're getting an exam with appropriate breathing in it, right? Educating the parents and the patients on that is helpful, parents especially. In terms of educating the patients, it may be helpful to tell them that you're just taking a picture. It might not be helpful because they might hate, hate getting their picture taken like most children do, right? So figuring out what kind of movies they like, figuring out what kind of toys they play with, all those things are helpful. So the first person to engage with when you're working with a pediatric patient is the parent. If the parent's present or a foster parent, whoever their caregiver is, Whoever that person is that has them there in that room, engage with that person per first. Because the entire world of the child is filtered through that individual. If that person says, we need to do this, they will listen to that person. They will not listen to you, right? Um, so get the parent on your side as quickly as possible. Um, and again, uh, all of the stuff that I just said about reducing radiation exposure is the ultimate goal of these types of interactions. I find working with pediatric patients to be very fun because it forces me to work creatively, right? Um, uh, and once you have those parents in your corner, they will think you hung the moon and the stars, right? Because they understand here's someone who really gets it. Okay, some states require documentation of the dose that we've given during an exam. When I was working in Texas, they required uh, documentation of dose and fluoro time. Um, for any of the surgery procedures that we are doing or any of the interventional procedures and they required a documentation of CT dose as well like the milligrade per centimeter type stuff um, so the time in the state of Tennessee from what I've seen they do not require dose documentation um, but I see it provided sometimes like for the HSGs at women's they provide a dose documentation sheet right what we're interested in and what the physicists need to know is um, uh, document the machine that you used, what protocol you used, all the technical settings, KVP and mass, etc. And if you're working on a fluoro machine, do not forget to document the fluoro time, right? Um, I include that because uh, since I worked in the state of Texas and other states, I continue to include that information in pretty much everything that I do, right? Um, because I think it is helpful to know that this person's aware of what their technical, con what their technical settings were and, and stuff like that. Like I mentioned before, these image receptors do play a part on patient radiation exposure. Um, 
In the days of film, we used speed class. So you know you're reading some old exam test questions if you see them saying anything about speed class, right? Um, from what I've seen of the registry, I do not see them asking questions about the speed class of different, like, <laughs> PSP plates, right? Um, could you ask those questions? Yes, you could. Um, but it's largely mediated by the software at this point. So um, nevertheless, it's still important to understand the techniques um, that cause variation in exposures for each machine that you use, right? So I think about some of the facilities that we work at where in the department they've got like GE, but in an ER they've got like a Shimatsu or something, and then in the other area they've got a Siemens or something. Each one of those imaging systems has a different image receptor in it and different technology and different ways of reporting things like an exposure indicator, right? Um, Ideally, something like the deviation index would help you understand what the different exposures are required for those different equipment. Um, what I'm saying is it's your responsibility to figure all that out. The registry really doesn't care whether or not you've actually taken that responsibility seriously. They just want you to know that that is the reality that you work in. That we, when you walk into a facility, it's your first day on the job, you need to know that the ER machine reports it this way and the department machine reports it that way. And that does affect patient dose. The only thing that I can think about, a direct question they could ask you about this, has to do with what I mentioned earlier about the computed radiography, the PSP plates requiring a higher patient dose because they have a lower detective quantum efficiency. Anytime we use grids, we will be doing two things. We'll be reducing uh, or improving scatter and increasing dose. So if you go from not using a grid to using a grid, you're decreasing, scat you're decreasing scatter and improving image contrast while increasing patient dose, right? Um, I think this has become a critical issue because I've heard that there's some clinical sites that have like a DR machine that's got a grid built into it and they just leave the grid on for every dang thing that they do. That's really, really dumb. Um, use the grid for anything basically that's uh, 13 centimeters or thicker. Um, anything less than that, basically anything smaller than a knee, you don't need a grid on, right? You do not need a grid for that. Um, <clears throat> we should be using the grids appropriately. That means that they should be, for the most part, perpendicular to the plane of the central ray, right? The central ray should be hitting the grid dead on. That's especially true with portable work, where we can have grid cut off because if we're shooting that AP chest x-ray and the patient's like gorked out in their bed and slumped over, we got this grid sticking out in funny ways. Um, be aware of that. Uh, and finally, you will be asked to calculate things like possibly a grid ratio or what increase in mass would be required for the use of a grid. For the most part, though, that will not be under this area. Um, this area of the test would just ask you to think critically about if you move up from a 5.1 grid to an 8.1 grid, what does that mean for the patient, right? You just increase their dose. Short answer. So why is that the case? Well, we're getting rid of scatter radiation, right? So we're reducing the amount of scatter that's reaching the image receptor. We're also reducing the amount of scatter that's reaching the automatic exposure control devices, right? So all of that reduction in scatter is um, requiring an increase in patient dose in order to cause sufficient amount of exposure to the image receptor. Does that make sense, what I just said? I know I'm talking kind of fast. Basically, grid good for the picture, bad for the patient, right, is the way I would sum it up. Now, there's a ton of junk that you need to know about fluoro, right, and how it affects the patient, which is ironic to me because we don't really, we're not the main driver of this machine, right? But I think one of the reasons they expect us to know so much about fluoro is in order to educate the driver while they're driving, right? So you're being asked to be a very informed backseat passenger, like backseat driver on this thing, right? Um, like, no, you weren't supposed to run that red light. Oh, really? Like, that's the kind of way that we have to interact with this stuff. So developing a rapport with your physician, letting them know about these different things may be required, right? Because um, I've seen the types of questions that they're asked in the radiography exams, right, for radiologists, and it ain't to the depth that you're getting it, right? 
Um, so intermittent and pulse fluoroscopy does a lot to decrease patient dose, as does the last image hold feature. So if you're working on any kind of equipment that, that's optional, go ahead and the first thing you do, just go ahead and turn that on. Like I told a radiologist once, I automatically turn on last image hold and the pulse mode. If you want to use something other than pulse mode, just know you need to turn that off yourself. Right? Um, limiting the fluor fluoroscopic field size. You can do that manually as well. If you know that you're doing like a lumbar puncture or something, guess what? You don't need that gigantic area to image. And you'll get much better pictures if you've collimated. So go ahead and collimate it slightly prior to the patient even entering the room. Um, technical exposure factors, right? For the most part, we're talking about 75 to 110 KVP for the adults, right? Um, <coughs> In general, the higher the KVP, the less the mass, right? But it still needs to be, um, to some degree, the discretion of the physician in the area that we're imaging. These machines are built with a source to skin distance indicator, <coughs> right? That's what an SSD is, source to skin distance indicator. It is a little bit different from an OID, right, um, or an SOD. All we're interested in is how close does the source get to the skin, right? Um, for stationary fluoroscopes, the ones with the big honking image receptor over the patient, you lock it into place, right? And it moves the bucky tray into position and all of that. That one should not be less than 38 centimeters or 15 inches. That means that the tube cannot get any closer than that to the table, right? And it's pretty much fixed in place because it's that important, right? Now think about how important that is, that they built this entire table to have an x-ray tube inside of it, right? In order to maximize that source to skin distance, right? And now think about how willy-nilly people use the C-arm in the OR, right? Now C-arms in the OR are considered mobile floor devices and the source to skin distance indicator should be 30 centimeters or a foot from the x-ray tube. Now, all C-arms are manufactured with this thing that um, looks like a glass with the bottom of it sawed off, right? And you're supposed to stick it over the end of the x-ray tube, and it is that SSD indicator. It indicates the distance of a foot from the source, right? I have never seen it used in any OR I've ever worked in. I hate using it too, right? Because whoever designed it didn't do us any favors, right? They built this thing to where it constantly falls off, which is the last thing that you want in a room full of blood and guts, right? A plastic device that's constantly falling off an x-ray tube. Everyone hates it. But technically, it should be in use with every C-arm that you're working with. It should be there on the C-arm somewhere. Has anyone ever seen this device that I'm talking about? Oftentimes <laughs> it's there by the instruction manual that's still in the plastic, right? But what you need to take away from this is that if you're working on a fixed or stationary fluoro machine, that source to skin distance is 15 inches. If you're working on the C-arm, it's a foot. This reduces patient exposure. Other things that we need to know about fluoro. There's a primary protective barrier, right? That's a two millimeter lead equivalent. It's required for all fluoroscopic units. Where is it on the fluoro unit? Oftentimes it's in the image intensifier. So if you wanna know why it's okay, if you've ever wondered, well, the x-ray tube's in the table, I sure hope no one's walking around above this room while we're doing this 15 minute fluoro procedure, right? If you ever had that consideration, well, the reality is you, that person walking around above the room should be perfectly fine. Because the reason that freaking image intensifier is so heavy is it's shrouded in two millimeters of lead. That's freaking heavy stuff. I know two millimeters doesn't sound like that much, but trust me, I've tried to pick it up before. It's insane, right? So one of the reasons that the fluoro towers on all those actuated motors is so that you can move around this gigantic lead block, right? Without like wearing your arm out in 15 seconds, right? The same is true for your C-arm. The image intensifier is a lead block, right? It's one of the reasons it's so hard to move, maneuver around. So if you ever get flack from the OR crew, let them know what you're driving is a giant lead block, right? 
and that should calm them down a little bit, maybe. Um, just uh, And the other thing is embrace the clunkiness of it. Like the more you embrace the clunkiness of this equipment, the more you'll be kind of where it's at um, in terms of using it. The fluoroscopic switch has to be a dead man style switch. That means that if you die, it turns off, right? Your finger has to be on the button for it to be making x-rays, right? Um, and that is what that switch is called, dead man switch. I've seen registry questions. In fact, I think your little <laughs> test today has a question about what type of switch is employed a fluoroscope. Um, filtration, it needs to have a half value layer of um, three to 4.5 millimeter of aluminum, right? So that's higher. That's higher than diagnostic, than general x-ray. Um, so it is higher. I think that as long as you understand it's higher than what we generally use for x-ray, you're good, right? Just know it's higher than that 2.5. They need to have a cumulative timing device, and we all know what that is. It's the fluoro timer, right? That automatically beeps when you've hit five minutes, and you tell the physician, you just hit the five minute fluoro timer, and they say reset it, right? Um, <clears throat> there should be some limitation to exposure rate, right? And this is required by the FDA. Um, it should have a maximum exposure rate of 100 milligray in air per minute. That's 10 Rankins in air per minute. Um, I have seen questions about that on registry type tests, that exposure rate um, situation. If they have a HLC, right, the high level fluoro devices that are sometimes used for cardio, they have a higher exposure rate. And the reason for that is because you're looking at the freaking heart and I'm really hoping that they find that Widowmaker, right? That's a serious consideration, much serious, more serious than getting a little skin burn on the patient's chest, right? So they are able to use those HLC devices, right? For the most part, in general fluoro, we don't play around with those, but they have a higher exposure rate. Um, of course, again, last image hold is gonna help. Has anyone seen the little app that they're using for training cardiologists? I can't remember what it's called, like CardioAx or something like that. Apparently, Deborah's grandson is really, really good at this thing. Like, I mean, you have to pick out your stent. You have to choose different contrast injection methods. Um, you, you can choose different balloons and everything to catheterize different areas of the heart. It's fascinating. Uh, and they're using it now to train cardiologists. It's, it's gamification of, of high-level fluoro. It's a cool app. Um, but the kid wants to be a farmer. He's like, don't want to, like, I'm, I'm telling her, tell him he needs to be a cardiologist. He's out there driving tractors and he's like nine years old. All right, the mobile fluoro unit. I love working on C-arms. I think they're cool. Um, I wish this was a picture of me. I thought about pasting my picture over it, but I didn't. Some other lucky fool. Um, uh, if you're standing close to uh, the patient, right, um, you will, can expect to receive a uh, increase in occupational scatter. Um, and so that's the number one thing that you can do if you want to increase your own dose when working in the fluoro suite. It's it kind of feels like Russian roulette or something when you're working with these things because the safest place to stand is the place where the x-ray tube is pointing at, right? So standing close to the image intensifier is actually one of the safest, safest places you can stand. Why? Because again, the image intensifier is a giant block of lead, right? And most of the scatter is back scatter coming off the patient and hitting that, the guy that's a jerk that no one likes that's the the neurosurgeon at that place, right? Um, no, I'm thinking of people at my own facilities I worked at. <laughs> I remember just always, anytime he's, he was such a jerk too, just I was thinking, oh, I'm frying your nads right now. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that. Um, yes. Yeah, it is, yeah. That's why I'm not naming any names or saying where this was. Um, so educating yourself, educating the people in the OR room is helpful. So if you like the surgeon, you can tell them. You, you might want to stand back while I make this exposure to look at the lumbar spine hardware we just put in, right? Here's a nice lead shield on wheels, right? Um, so educating people in the room as well is helpful, right? Letting them know, hey, you're actually on the part where most of the radiation is going because it's backscatter. Those are helpful things to do. Here's an illustration of what that looks like from the point of view of the x-ray tube. So we can see on um, most C-arms, they're designed to have the tube low, right? To where they're underneath the patient for like a, I guess what would be a PA projection. I generally tend to still think of it as an AP projection, but I've got that image intensifier close to the patient's skin. 
And part of what I'm doing when I lower that image intensifier down is I'm also increasing what? The source to skin distance, right? So I'm bringing the image intensifier down and I'm increasing that source to skin distance. I'm reducing the patient's dose because that x-ray is coming up from underneath the table. Ideally, the x-rays are hitting the bottom of the table and backscattering down towards the floor. That's the perfect place for them to backscatter towards. Um, and there's just a repeat of that requirement for the one foot from the tube for most of what we do. Um, it does say preferably the tube's going to be positioned underneath the patient again to reduce patient uh, occupational dose to the people in the room. I did have a, a, a physician, maybe you've seen this as well, they wanted me to flip the, uh, the C-arm assembly upside down because the tube side is smaller on most C-arms, right? And it got in their way less if they're doing like a hand or something like that. I would flip the C-arm upside down for that physician, but I would also wear lead glasses in that room and I would inform everyone in that room not just the physician, that choosing to do so was increasing everyone's occupational dose, right? For just the reasons that are illustrated here. The final thing that we've got going on, right, um, is a dose area product meter. Ways to uh, estimate what is the dose for the entire um, exposure field, right? This is sometimes called a DAP, a dose area product, right? It's an expression of dose multiplied times the area squared, right? You don't necessarily need to know how to calculate a DAP. For the most part, your machines will start automatically calculating DAPs for you. In fact, I would imagine within the next five to 10 years, all the equipment that we're working on will calculate a DAP. It will report a DAP, and that will probably be the main way that we will start um, documenting dose. Will just be, this was the DAP for the procedure, right? Um, for, for example, general x-ray. Um, what it's working on, if it does report a DAP on the procedure, is that's still an estimate. It's estimating the DAP based on the image receptor exposure, right? To actually calculate a DAP requires a fancy physics device. Um, don't worry, the physicist does bring it in, and they do make DAP measurements. They're required to by law annually or every 13 months. Um, what you need to know about all of that is two things. There's two things that they're doing from this DAP meter, right? The first is measuring exposure linearity, right? Exposure linearity. That means that if I set an exposure of 30 mass and I push the button over and over and over again, the DAP reader should read pretty much the same thing every time. It should read pretty much the same thing. There'll be slight fluctuations in the exposure, but it should be pretty close to the same. Right? The other thing that they might look at is uniformity. And uniformity is looking at the area of the exposure. Was there a hot spot and a cold spot? Right? Now we know there probably is a hot spot and a cold spot, right? Because of anode heal effect and things like that. They cause a lack of uniformity across the area of the exposure. That's it's expected. It should not vary more than a certain percentage that the health physicists get to figure out. Okay? That's everything that I figured out that we need to know about patient safety, okay? So let's take a break and then we'll talk about occupational stuff.